Hello, my lovely anatomists and physiologists. Welcome back. We are finally ready to talk about internal respiration, which is going to be gas exchange with internal environment. And so that means our cells. So what we're talking about here is how we're going to get, in this case, oxygen moving from the alveolus into the capillary and transport it out to our tissues. And then we'll do the reverse conversation in a later video looking at carbon dioxide gas. When we're talking about the movement of our oxygen, we can do our picture here of our um, alveolus and let's do our capillary right beside. So what I'm gonna do is have like a circle that's my alveolus and a circle that's my capillary. And then I'm going to in purple do a circle and I'm just gonna call it um, a body cell. And so what we're looking at in terms of our oxygen transport is how are we going to get oxygen to follow its partial pressure? So when we're looking at the alveolus, remember we said our partial pressure for oxygen, partial pressure for oxygen was equal to about 104 millimeters of mercury in the alveolus. And so then we had a partial pressure of oxygen initially in the capillary of 64 millimeters of mercury. And I'm gonna change my diagram here in just a few minutes. So what we saw is the movement of oxygen from the alveolus to the capillary. When that happens, I'm gonna draw a line through my partial pressure of oxygen so I can rewrite it because now the oxygen has moved in. We're going to see oxygen in like the systemic capillary being about 100 millimeters of mercury. So as that blood does leave the lungs and go back to the heart and then travel out to the body, we do see so that some of that oxygen does diffuse from the capillary to those tissues that it goes through so that when it's in the systemic circuit, the partial pressure of oxygen is more like 100 millimeters per mer of mercury. And then our body cells are at about 40. So the partial pressure of our body cells is about 40. So of course, we're getting oxygen moving out of our capillary and to our body cells. And so that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about with internal respiration. Now, when we talk about getting that oxygen actually transported through the body, what we see is, of course, we know that the transport is happening inside the red blood cell, specifically in the molecule called hemoglobin, which we've studied extensively in the cardiovascular system. And if we want to think about this hemoglobin molecule as like these little oxygen boats, remember there's like four seats in each boat for that oxygen. And those seats would be the heme with that iron. So it's really an affinity or attraction between the oxygen and the iron that's allowing for this transportation of oxygen. So each hemoglobin molecule can transport up to four oxygen molecules. And so what we would say is if a hemoglobin molecule is transporting four oxygen molecules, if all the seats are taken, that would be considered like 100% saturated. So we'll talk about hemoglobin saturation. We'll talk about hemoglobin saturation as like how many seats are filled, how many seats are empty type of thing. And what we'll see is that the average, the average hemoglobin saturation is somewhere between 95 to 99%. So not every single seat of every single boat is filled, but most of them are. 
I have here a picture of hemoglobin from our OpenStax textbook. Remember your hemoglobin is a globular protein. It's made up of four amino acid subunits. At the center of each of those subunits, you have a heme, and at the center of each heme, you have an iron group. And so that's what that diagram is reminding us of. Now, when we say the majority of the oxygen is transported on hemoglobin, it's something like um, maybe like 98.5% in the hemoglobin. So we do see about one and a half percent is just going to be dissolved in the plasma. So, so that's really a minute amount and we are seeing the majority of our oxygen transported with our hemoglobin molecule. Now, when we talk about our hemoglobin molecule and we talk about hemoglobin saturation, we see that not only do we need that oxygen to kind of take its seat on the molecule to be able to move through the body, but then it needs to get off. It needs to get off that seat, right? We need to make sure that the oxygen can actually leave the hemoglobin and go out to the tissue as needed. And we've already talked about like our capillary beds as being resource allocation masters. And we said, you don't get all of the blood moving through all of your capillary beds. It's pretty much on an as needed basis. And what we see too, is even if we do have blood moving through a certain capillary bed, we don't get all of the oxygen leaving. It's on an as needed basis. So not only are we being very uh, careful in allocating where the blood goes, but we're also very careful in releasing our oxygen. And again, we see that if you're an active tissue, you have a higher oxygen need. If you're in tissue at rest, you have less need, right? And so we'll see characteristics of active tissue make it easier for the oxygen to leave the hemoglobin and go out to the tissue. So, so we'll see different characteristics um, determine whether the hemoglobin like holds on to the oxygen or whether it lets go. Okay, so let's look at those different characteristics. One of the things we do want to see is that initially, the more, um, the higher your partial pressure of oxygen, the greater the hemoglobin binding. Or we can also say increase affinity. Okay, so what, what are we talking about here? When one oxygen um, takes a seat on the hemoglobin, it makes it easier for a second oxygen to take a seat. And then when you have two oxygens, attached to hemoglobin is easier to get that third attached. And then once you have three, it's like super easy to get the fourth attached. So the higher your oxygen level, the easier it is to get the oxygen bound to the hemoglobin and transport it on. So we do see that characteristic. And then we do see, remember, we do see that our oxygen is going to move from a high partial pressure of oxygen to a low partial pressure of oxygen. So it is important to pay attention again. That's what we were illustrating in that earlier drawing, that the oxygen is moving along its partial pressure gradient. So we can say that. And this also then varies based on tissue activity. So if we're moving through an active tissue, the active tissue has a very low partial pressure. And so a lot of oxygen gets off the ride and goes out to that active tissue. If we're traveling through something like an adipose tissue that doesn't have a lot of activity, then maybe we have some oxygen leave and go to that tissue, but not quite as much. So this is enabling us to sort of moderate how much oxygen actually goes to different tissues. So let's write a note that active tissue has um, a greater 
O2 need, or you might want to put in parentheses for yourself, meaning it has a low partial pressure of oxygen. So that's how we actually know it, know <laughs> that it has that need, right? Okay, we'll also see that if you increase the temperature, you're gonna increase the release of the oxygen. This should make sense also in terms of active tissues. So when you're doing metabolism, you're generating heat. So active tissues are gonna have a slightly elevated temperature. And so they're gonna need more oxygen. So this is really lovely. It makes it easier for the oxygen to hop off the boat and onto the tissue as needed. We'll see a low pH. also increases the release of oxygen. Now this one's really interesting. Low pH means acidic. Low pH means acidic. And what we'll see is there's a direct relationship where you have a lot of carbon dioxide gas, that's going to reduce the pH in that particular area. So as we're talking about this, we'll see that a low pH can be coming from an increase of carbon dioxide gas, which can also give an increase of just hydrogen ion. We'll see you can get an increase of lactic acid as a result of metabolism. We might also get the increase of carbonic acid So a low pH is an indicator of an active tissue. A low pH is an indicator of an active tissue. So again, you know, we're seeing that active tissue is gonna have a low partial pressure of oxygen. That's gonna make it easier for the oxygen to hop off and go to your tissue. Active tissue is gonna have a higher temperature. That's gonna make it easier for the oxygen to hop off the hemoglobin, go to your tissue. Your active tissue will have a lower pH. So this also makes it easier to jump off the hemoglobin boat and go out to your tissue. Again, I mean, to me, this is so amazing. So not only did we see resource allocation in terms of blood flow through the capillary, it was so specific, right? But now we're seeing, okay, we have the blood flowing through that tissue and how much oxygen does it actually need? And so this is another example of that, um, kind of that equity versus equality, right? Remember equity is like, equality is like give everybody a shoe, equity is like give everybody a shoe, that fits. Okay, the other factor that we look at, the other factor that we look at is an increase of what is abbreviated BPG. That's really the label that you need to know. I'm gonna go ahead and write down for you B. PG stands for 2,3-biphosphoglycerate. Okay, now this is a molecule that's being produced um, for glycolysis. It's important in glycolysis. Red blood cells, remember, are only performing glycolysis to make their ATP because they don't have any mitochondria. So BPG is an important component, an important molecule that red blood cells need for glycolysis. And what we'll see is that when you have a high level of BPG, you get um, an easy time releasing oxygen. Okay, so increasing the metabolism of a red blood cell makes it easier for that red blood cell to release oxygen. Let's add some details to this. Let's add some details. One detail to add is that hormones like epinephrine, hormones like your thyroxin, so we abbreviate those as T3s and T4, and hormones like growth hormone, GH, are all able to increase the production of BPG. So we're seeing that these are hormones that are involved in some of our fight or flight, increased activity, increased growth, increased metabolism sorts of hormones. And so it makes sense that we would want to make it easier to get oxygen out to those tissues. 
The other thing to, to pay attention to here is that your old red blood cells have a reduction in their BPG. And pay attention to how I have my arrows. So it's a direct relationship between BPG and releasing oxygen. So your high BPG level gives you a good release. If you have a low BPG level, I'm going to say you kind of get stingy with that oxygen. You don't let go of it the way that you should. So this is another one of those characteristics that the macrophage of the spleen are detecting. And one of the important reasons why we need to remove and recycle those old worn out red blood cells. Remember, they're not flexible. They're not having as easy of a time moving through the circulatory system. And then here, they're not releasing oxygen in the way that they should. This is also why your red blood cells um, from donated blood have a shelf life because they get to a point where they're not really letting go of the oxygen the way that they should. Okay, going back up to this conversation about pH, there was one more piece of information that I needed to write down for you. And that is that this relationship is referred to as the Bohr effect. And that's this relationship of pH and release of oxygen. So we can highlight that one. 